<laughs> it's all good. It's all good. All right. So welcome to Mind, Mind Body, Body Relationship. And today we're talking to Nicole. And Nicole has been on her internship here at the Counseling House for the past eight months now. Yeah. Yes. And is nicely finishing as of today. Yes, I'm very excited, but I'm also, it's a bit bittersweet. Uh-huh. I bet it is. Yes, yes. So, uh, of course, my name is uh, Dr. Lori, and uh, I am the uh, clinical supervisor here at the Counseling House. And so, Nicole, for her final day, is going to be talking about sleep with us. Yes. So, how about, Nicole, if you tell us a little bit about yourself? I am a Master of Counseling Psychology student. I complete as of today, which is exciting. I am currently working at an addiction center. It's called Stonehenge Therapeutic Community. And I work there as, right now, an overnight counselor. So a lot of the time it's very safety based. So uh, I've had a lot of crisis moments that I've had to deal with I in the know. process. But yeah, that's yeah. basically what, what it is that you do yeah. and what it is that brings you here. Yes. And then you're going to be uh, on the job search once it is yes, that you're done today. <laughs> Which is a little bit nerve wracking given the circumstances, but that's right. That's exactly. Okay as well. In the midst of COVID-19, <laughs> right? <laughs> a new challenge. A new challenge. Yes. Yes. Very good. So I would assume that one of the things, because you do do uh, overnight, in uh, regards to Stonehenge, which is located in Guelph, uh, you must come across a lot of difficulty in regards to residents sleeping. Yes, we actually have a lot of residents who will come knock on our door and ask us to, because we are an addiction center, we do lock up for the safety of everybody right. in the middle of the night. So we do get a lot of residents who will ask us to unlock the doors because they want to smoke. Oh. which smoking is actually something that promotes insomnia. Ah. So it's a little bit of an interesting conflict because they can't sleep, they want to smoke, but nicotine is considered a stimulant. So that will actually keep them up and it actually will also irritate the air passageways ah. as well. Okay. So it can increase snoring, essentially. Oh. <laughs> And because it's a stimulant and it is nicotine, what often will happen too is people will go through the withdrawal effects while they're sleeping. So their sleep will be a lot lighter. Oh, interesting. So I find it interesting that they want to go out and smoke in the middle of the night because it's actually conflicting more with their sleep than anything else. Mm -hmm. So there's different causes of insomnia, right? I mean, uh, I guess insomnia would be based in not being able to sleep. Yeah. And being able to get to sleep, not being able to stay asleep. Yes. And I bet a lot of people actually really do struggle with that, regardless of whether or not they're located at a, a center or whatever that might be. Um, sleep patterns uh, sort of ebb and flow, don't they? They're not constant or consistent. Yep. Yes. And there's a number of things that get in the way in regards to insomnia. There are. A lot of it is learned behaviors and habits that we develop that we don't actually realize impact our sleep. Mm. So there's a huge amount of things that people can do to alter their sleep. And there's also a few things as well to consider when it comes to sleep. Right. Because there's things like sunlight. When you go out into the sunlight, your melatonin actually decreases, which pushes your body rhythm to actually increase in temperature. Ah, yes. Whereas if you are inside a lot, it will, and you're in the dark, it will decrease. Right, right. Yes, yes. So your circadian rhythm. Yes. Yes, yes. It is affected. So it is really good to actually have that sunlight um, in, your, in your eyesight, right? Yes. During the day especially, it's actually one of the things that's very encouraged for us to do during the day because it will help raise our temperature. And a lot of the times too, if you do not, if you're living that sedentary life mm. and you don't get enough sunlight, it can help Im or it can impact insomnia. Oh yes, definitely. I mean, basically you're like in hibernation then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's why it is that they say about t turning off electronics at night. Yes. Um, sunlight, you want 
everything to be as dark as possible when you are sleeping. Mm. But it's not just about that. Noise pollution can be a huge thing that keeps people up. Oh, I so bet. the sound of the city, it could be somebody snoring beside you. Ooh. That actually <laughs> sleeping with a partner is actually something that increases insomnia because two people often aren't always... There's always one who struggles a little bit more than the other with sleep. And one of the recommendations that there actually is, is if you are sleeping with a partner to make sure your bed is big enough. Uh. The bigger the bed, although you might not feel as intimate with your partner, it's a lot more comfortable to sleep at that point. Because if someone's tossing and turning, which we regularly do switch positions in our sleep, it's to avoid having your partner essentially wake you up all night. Oh, I bet. Yes. No touchy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear. Yeah. yeah. So there are a lot of components. Uh, speaking of which, you know, the increasing body temperature, temperature at night is really important as well. Yes. Yes. Too hot, too cold is uncomfortable. Very. Mm -hmm. And usually it's the heat because when you are in a room that's too hot, which I've experienced way too much to admit, <laughs> no AC for a bunch of years throughout university, essentially because it's the room is so hot, you can't lower your body temperature. So your body temperature is always too high to actually fall asleep, mm -hmm. which is why opening a window, using a fan, anything you can do to lower the temperature is better. Mm. I know that it can be a lot harder for people financially because there are a lot of places, especially people who are renting houses, most places don't come with AC. So it's a oh, lot oh, more yes. challenging. And I've lived that experience and I can completely understand the struggle. Yes, air conditioning is lovely, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> it's a privilege. <laughs> it is a privilege. Well, so is uh, central heating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Have you ever tried one of those gel pillows or the new gel uh, mattresses at all? Because they're supposed to help with lowering temperature. I'm not sure what mattress we use, but it is, it might be gel because I know that it shapes around your body. Oh, okay. Yes. And do you find that that's helpful in regards to temp lowering temperature? Lowering temperature, I don't think it impacts anything. Uh, I just find it super comfortable. Oh, well, that's <laughs> nice. Super comfortable is nice. Yeah. Yes, yes. So what are some of the other uh, things that affect our sleep besides uh, noise, uh, smoking, um, you know, distance between one another? There are several things. One of them, I'm trying to pick one out of the top of my head. One of them is our thoughts. Ah. So our thoughts can impact in two ways. The first one is a lot of the times when we struggle to sleep, we build this ability to, we have a lot of negative sleep thoughts, oh, okay. essentially. And we don't realize we're doing it because automatic thoughts are very quick. Yes. We don't even think about it. It just comes up in our head and goes as it pleases. But a lot of the times we will say a lot of negative things about sleep. Mm. And it's about, too, being able to build the awareness of that. Because a lot of the times we don't realize we're doing it. So how can you change something when you don't know you're doing it? So true. I mean, when I think about like sleep hygiene, uh, the routine of sleep, sometimes what happens is it's kind of like a miscue. We lay down and then we give ourselves permission to start to think about things and then actually really want to talk. <laughs> uh huh. What are some suggestions in regards to that? For thoughts wise? Yeah, for thoughts. When it is that you're actually giving yourself that miscue that now that you're laying down, it's time to start to think or time to start to talk or whatever it is that that might be. Well, one of the suggestions too, because a lot of what I'm talking about too is based on Say Goodnight by Dr. Greg Jacobs. Ah. And what they suggest too is to, when you do go to bed, make sure that you're going to bed when you feel drowsy. Oh, okay. If you don't feel like you're falling asleep within 20 to 30 minutes to actually get up. Because oh. if you stay longer than that 20 to 30 minutes, you're actually associating the bed with wakefulness. Oh. And then it's even more difficult to fall asleep. And then those thoughts are going to get even worse. Yes. For the thoughts itself, I would recommend and they recommend doing a journal, basically. Oh, okay. So when you go to bed writing down any thoughts that you might have to do with sleep. Mm -hmm. whether it be negative or positive and then if you do wake up in the middle of the night the same thing if you find yourself you can't fall back asleep 
And then it's the same if you wake up too early and you can't seem to fall back asleep. So you get up for the day. It's writing down any of those negative thoughts that you do have. Mm. And then trying to, to work to replace those negative thoughts with more positive ones. So understanding, for one, for example, would be that the requirement to sleep for eight hours is a myth. We mm. don't actually need eight hours of sleep. And studies have actually shown that people who sleep seven hours live longer than people who sleep eight hours or more. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, it's actually a myth. So when you tell yourself when you're trying to sleep, I need these eight hours, you actually don't. In fact, you actually only need five and a half hours because five and a half hours is the amount that you need to get your core sleep. Oh, okay. And then the core sleep, if anyone is curious, is when we sleep, we go through several stages. So there's stage one, which is kind of like drowsiness. Mm -hmm. And if you see someone who's kind of falling asleep, I'll use a lecture as an example. If you're at a lecture and you see someone who's starting to doze off, that's most likely stage one. Okay. Stage two is the next step. And that is actually how we spend 50% of our time when we do sleep. And it's a lighter sleep. Yeah. And then we have stage three and four, which is the deep sleep, which mm-hmm. is 100% of the core sleep. So that's what you're looking to gain. Oh, okay. But stage two is also important in the sense that it's actually what physically energizes us. Oh, okay. And then the last one is REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. And then that's where we go through dreams. Mm-hmm. And that's also how we process all our information. Right. So that's also why newborns actually have a lot more REM sleep because they're processing all this new information. Mm, Yes. And that's actually really important, isn't it? To process the information, the things that happen to us during the day. Yeah. Yes. And the truth is, is that a lot of the times um, sleep is affected by how passive or aggressive you actually really are personality wise too. So that if you're passive during the day, you have a tendency to have very aggressive dreams at night. I think you're making up for it. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. So what are some other things that we need to take into consideration in regards to our sleep patterns? One might be, just as a thought, like you're talking about the addiction center, alcohol. Yes. Yes, because a lot of people really feel like when it is that they're uh, drinking before bed, it's actually really helping them uh, get to sleep. It's not because it's actually... You go through withdrawal symptoms for alcohol as well. And those withdrawal symptoms make you sleep a lot lighter. Your sleep is fragmented. It's disturbed. Mm. It also relaxes some of the muscles in your body to the point where it can actually agitate snoring and sleep apnea. Oh, okay. So alcohol before bed is actually a bad idea. And it can also increase dependency on it to Uh, sleep. Yes. Well, it's a depressant. Yes. Yes. And so it does feel like you're putting yourself to sleep, right? Only it doesn't help with continued sleep during the night. No. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Other than alcohol too, diet is another one. Oh, yes. There is a lot of things too that you could use to help you sleep. One of them is actually complex carbohydrates can help you sleep at night. So a bagel, a cracker. Things like that can actually help if you have it one to two hours before you go to sleep. Oh, okay. And those ones are okay. There are some that will increase your likelihood to stay awake. Protein is one of them. Oh, okay. MSGs, because MSGs, which are often in Chinese food, they're a stimulant. Right, yes. And then there are refined sugars and refined carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Those can keep you up. And then anything that might increase gas... Um, indigestion, (laughs) all of that stuff. Oh yeah, definitely. Because when you lay down, of course, you're putting, you're putting pressure on your esophagus. Yeah. Right. And so that's GERD, like regurgitating the food, right? Which irritates your esophagus, which can cause some significant health issues. And the truth is, if you don't get enough sleep, it actually does affect your health. Yeah. Yes. And so a lot, of, a lot of difficulties in regards to, like, for example, hypertension, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so even watching what you eat is important. And, and then when. even yeah. yeah. And 
one thing that they did suggest too is if you do take in a carbohydrate right before you go to sleep, that will actually help keep you asleep in the night. Mm -hmm. So it's to stop you from waking up in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because really when you think about it, when it is that you're sleeping, uh, you're not eating. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Right? So um, as it is that you're not eating, you're actually, what is the word? You're... You're fasting. That's right. You're <laughs> fasting during the night. So your brain actually really does need something to work off of. Yep. Right? But just not too much so that you're actually really keeping yourself awake because you've eaten too much. Mm-hmm. So that was another important one. And then one of the obvious ones, too, that can come up is exercise. Ah, and a lot of the times, too, exercise and sunlight work hand in hand because a lot of people will exercise outside. So when you go outside, your body temperature increases mm. and that will help you to be more alert and awake. Yes. It's the only recommendation, too, is also not to exercise about three to six hours before you're going to sleep because of that rise in temperature. If your temperature is too high, you're not going to sleep. Right. You're waiting for that once you exercise and your temperature rises, it'll eventually fall. Mm -hmm. And then it's at that point that you do want to sleep. Oh, okay. So a soothing, calm, and relaxing before bed. Yes. Yes. Um, what are your thoughts about like going for like a short walk or something like that? Those will be, those will work. The only thing that I might be concerned about is if it's late at night, I'm just thinking the people who wake up at 4 a.m. Uh, you don't want to go outside necessarily because I'm not sure if that will keep you up. Mm, okay. So reading, uh, meditating. Um, you can walk around the house too. Well, okay, so walking around the house. <laughs> <laughs> and you can do something like watching TV if that relaxes you, but the recommendation is do not do any of that stuff in your bed. Oh, okay. If you do do that stuff in your bed, limit it to 30 minutes or else that will also cue your body to associate the bed with wakefulness. Oh, okay. Oh, that makes sense. What about shift workers? Because that would be one of the things in my mind that I would think would be really, really um, difficult in regards to good sleep. Coming home at really strange times. <laughs> I can vouch for that those ones for sure because I do 11 to 7. And the recommendations too for that because once you go home, you always have lighter sleep. Uh -huh. And you have the biggest challenge in the middle of the night because naturally your body temperature drops around 4 a.m. Mm. So the largest cue to sleep is actually around 3.30 a.m. Wow. And I've experienced that one unfortunately and your when your body temperature drops you're actually freezing cold mm. and it's very unpleasant but when you do leave you want to wear sunglasses to avoid sunlight as much as you can unfortunately in my position on some of the days we have to go outside oh, okay. so i unfortunately have a lot more difficulty falling asleep on those days because of the fact that I'm out there and my body temperature naturally rises with the sun. Ah, uh, yes, of course, of course. So are there any other uh, thoughts in regards to um, sleep and things that interrupt sleep? Well, one thing that comes to the top of my head that we could talk about too is another way if you're looking for something to help you fall asleep is taking a bath. Because taking a bath will naturally rise your body temperature as well. So if you take a bath and then wait a few hours and then go to bed, your temperature will eventually fall from that as well. Oh. So kind of like exercise. Oh, interesting. Just maybe not as effective as exercise. Yes, yes, that's very interesting. Uh, also, uh, caffeine. Yes. Right? Uh, and what does caffeine do to your body? Caffeine is a bit interesting. The recommendation is to not have any caffeine after noon because the one thing we actually don't think about is the fact that caffeine lasts in your body up to six hours. Wow. So if you are taking it after noon, there is a chance that it can keep you up at night. Oh, okay. And yes. then the 
definite too is to avoid giving it to children because it's a lot worse with children Mm -hmm. than it is with adults. But the one thing I was surprised by is the fact that there are some things I never expected caffeine to be in that it's in. Like yogurt was one. Oh, interesting. I think of chocolate. Yep. Yes, yes. What other things is caffeine in? It was also an ice cream. Oh, ice cream. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the good things. Well, that's right. Exactly. I suppose anything that causes like a flush, right, it means that your your temperature is actually really increasing. Yep. Yes. So that's good to pay attention to because that can be either hot or cold, right? Either it could be wine or it could be soup, right? Yep. Yeah. So that's good to really think about. Anyway, well, thank you so much, Nicole, for coming in and talking to us about sleep. That's really good. It's no problem. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you. And hopefully you found that helpful. And if you have any questions or anything like that, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and ask those questions. We'll be very, very pleased to answer them. Uh, Give us a like and uh, join us next time as it is that we talk about mind, body, and relationship. (laughs) 